Yeah, no, it'll be fine. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I don't have like a booming loud voice. And I do talk with my hands, so this kind of makes me a little bit mute. To have one hand, I have to keep close, but we'll, we'll make it work. Um, thank you so much. There's a lot of fog here, isn't there? <laughs> I got up this morning, and uh, of course you don't need thick coats and uh, you know, thermal underwear or anything like that when you're here, but you do have to deal with fog, so it's not something we regularly have back in frozen Minnesota, which I, I, I know I'm not a big football fan, uh, I don't follow football real closely. I'm a huge baseball fan. Don't get me started on baseball, but not football. But I, I read today that we are going to have the coldest, it could potentially be the coldest football game in the history of the NFL this weekend uh, between you guys and us guys. So I will not be offended if you beat us. Uh, <laughs> I think you guys are... Didn't we, didn't we play once already this year? Yeah. And you just destroyed us, right? Like absolutely annihilated us. Okay. I expect more of the same. Unless, <laughs> unless, unless cold is a really big problem for you guys. Um, we're actually in the process right now of, of we, we did, and it's a great analogy uh, for, for this conversation too, because in Minnesota, uh, we built the Metrodome back in 1984. And the Metrodome was the, the, the end of the like plastic stadium phase, right? We, we all went, we, we went through this phase. You, you guys had a plastic stadium, right? The base, yeah. What was it? Kingdom. Kingdom, yeah. So, so there was this, this phase, this like cultural phase where we all thought like the coolest thing to do was to build these space age plastic stadiums. And like that was gonna be the retro revolution. And of course, we don't jump on things. We, uh, you know, are are slow. On, you know, everybody else has got to do it first, and they're like, well, "Yeah, we we could probably do this. We won't do it as good as everybody else, but we'll we'll try, you know, a little bit." This is a Minnesota way. So so we 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 built our stadium in 1984, and we were very proud of it. It's like this is this is great. Um, and then three years later, Camden Yards opened up in Baltimore. And it was kind of like, wow, what? we've got you know, 30 years with this, and that's beautiful, and this is horrible. I had season tickets at the Metrodome for baseball, and it was built as a football stadium, so you would sit in your seat and stare at the outfield. And then like, all the action was going on uh, over at the, at the plate. <laughs> so we went through this thing in Minnesota where we now, we're going go to we're gonna get with the 80s right? Um, so, so we built three, we built three stadiums. We built Target Field, a brand, first we built a field for the University of Minnesota, for their football team, TCF Stadium. And we had to do that because that was like the, um, the gateway drug to stadiums. You can't build a, you, you can't build a professional stadium and give away money to, to pro teams till you do the university one. So we had to get that one done first. We did that one, got the university done. Then uh, we built Target Field, so the twins moved out of the Metrodome into Target Field. Uh, then we uh, decided that we were gonna build what now is gonna be US Bank Stadium, which if you've ever, if you see the original Star Wars movie, the Jawas travel around in that one weird looking vehicle. The stadium looks like that. It's got this weird, so that's what we're building. So next year, if we play you in the playoffs, it will be indoors. But this year, we're spending two seasons at TCF Field, which incidentally was done for the college team, which never makes a bowl game, and we're never going to host a bowl game. So it doesn't have any warm weather facilities, like cold weather facilities. No, everything freezes. There's no underground anything. There's no like, place to warm up. There's no like, heat. So this will be really cold. <laughs> But this is it. This will be like our last game. Because I think if we lose, obviously we're done. But I think if we win, we go somewhere else. So this will be the la potentially the last outdoor game in Minnesota history. And it will be with you. So thank you. <laughs> so that's the extent of my football. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about why 
cities are going broke and why we struggle financially to do just basic things. Uh, I was, uh, worked for many years as a civil engineer, uh, went to graduate school, got a planning degree, started working as a planner. And in 2008, I started writing a blog for myself to try to answer the question, why are cities struggling financially? Why, despite all the growth, despite all the prosperity, despite all the success and strength that we have as a nation, why do our cities struggle to just do basic, basic things? So what we're going to do today is talk about the answer to that question, the implications of it, and then what we can start to do differently. Just real briefly about our organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, I work in Minnesota, but we have people who work all over the country. Uh, if you're interested in us, our mission is to support a model of growth development that allows our cities to become financially strong and resilient. There's a handout that I gave you. If you're interested in us, if you're interested in, in getting more from us, you can fill out the back. Uh, we do a follow-up to all these, uh, and we've got one scheduled for later this month. If you want to participate in that online, uh, just get me your form at the end, and we'll make sure you are signed up. Uh, we started as a blog. We still do a blog. You get five days a week of content from us and a podcast and videos and a, and a whole bunch of different things on our site, which I'll give you at the very end. I want you to... This is really a worthless thing. Uh, I want you to think back to the way we built cities thousands of years ago. These are two artist renderings. The one on the left is an ancient city called Ur, about 6,000 BC, one of the oldest civilizations that's ever been excavated, Fertile Crescent. The, the one on the right, of course, is ancient Rome. If you think about the way these cities were built, they were built around the dominant transportation technology of the day, that, of course, being your two feet. People walked everywhere, and so the scale of the places, the distance between different types of things you would do on a normal day, the spacing between buildings, all this was based around a society of people who walked. Fast forward thousands of years. This is my hometown. Uh, I live in a little town of Brainerd, Minnesota, about two and a half hours north of Minneapolis-St. Paul. This is what it looked like in 1904. Again, people would arrive by stagecoach, they'd arrive by train, but once they got to town, you were goofing with the lights, That'd be awesome. Yeah. Once they, uh, once they arrived at town, uh, what would they do? They would walk everywhere they went. And so the spacing of the buildings, the distance between different types of things you would do on a, different, on, a, on a typical day, all this stuff was scaled to a society of people who walked. Beginning in the early 1900s and then accelerating after World War II, we began to build places around a different transportation technology. That, of course, being the automobile. We came up with different building types, different building styles, different ways of arranging things on the landscape. If we were to ask people to explain this, they would most likely talk about it in terms of progress. We used to be people who walked everywhere. We built cities around people who walked. We're now people who drive everywhere. We build cities around people who drive. Someday we will have jet cars, and we will build cities around jet cars. And someday we will teleport and we will build cities in a completely different way. This is a narrative of progress, things always getting better. There's another way to look at this, though, that isn't quite as affirming, isn't quite as comforting. And I want to put this notion in the back of your head as kind of a backdrop to this entire conversation today. If we look at these places that were built thousands of years ago around people who walked, we have to understand and acknowledge that humans have been building places for thousands of years before we got to this point. We had been experimenting with different ways to build places. Some of those experiments were successful. When they were, they were copied and expanded upon. Some of those experiments were failures. And by failures, I mean people died, right? Civilizations went away. Places didn't exist because the path that they had chosen, the experiment they had tried to do, didn't work out. Over thousands of years of experimentation, little trial and error experiments across a broad area, what emerged was a pattern of development. A pattern of development that looked eerily similar across different cultures, different continents, different latitudes, and different civilizations. 
an emergent set of properties and conditions that were, un, that were resilient and strong and compatible with us as humans. When we look at this style of development, even though for us, this is all we've ever known, right? It, how many times have you heard it? This is the way things are done, right? Even though for us, this is the way things are done, it's important for us to understand that this is a huge experiment. We didn't try this out. We didn't, we didn't try this out in Oregon to see how it would go, monitor it for a couple hundred years, take the best ideas and slowly migrate them in to our way of doing things, right? We just did this all at once across an entire continent in a generation. We transformed an entire way of living and an entire economy in a generation on a new experimental idea. It's important for us to acknowledge that we are living through one of the greatest experiments that's ever been tried. Nobody has ever been here before. There is no playbook for what we do. We are making it up as we go along. Nobody has ever tried to do this. It's not a small departure from what we did before. It is a radical, radical shift in our way of doing business. I want you to have that in the back of your mind as we talk about some of the financial implications of this way of building. If we go back 100 years and we look at Olympia, or we look at Seattle, or we look at really any city in the United States, and we say, we want to have jobs and growth and economic development, how are those things going to come about? They were going to be byproducts of things that were done locally. There was no outside mechanism that was going to impact that. If you were going to have a successful place, that was going to emerge from things that you did at the local level. Today, we create jobs and growth and economic opportunity using three primary financial mechanisms. The first is transfer payments between governments. This is the idea that the federal government, the state government, as our partners in creating jobs and growth, come up with programs and subsidies and grants and different types of things to funnel money into things that create growth and jobs. The second is transportation spending. I know there's a lot of you here in this room that work for the DOT. Uh, I interviewed uh, your transportation commissioner a couple years ago. Fascinating. Uh, but one of the things that we disagreed on, uh, respectfully, uh, was the notion that transportation spending creates jobs. Uh, that is our, you know, today when we want jobs, what do we do? We invest in transportation because transportation creates jobs, not only in the building of things, we employ people to build things. Sometimes we employ people to dig up things in the ground that we have put there in, uh, under the idea that we're going to make transportation investments, try to figure out how to make use of big tunnels we have. Uh, that employs a lot of people. Uh, but then theoretically, when we're done building these things, they also create a platform where we get growth, right? This is kind of embedded in our psyche. Uh, the third mechanism then is debt. Public debt is an important part of the conversation, yes, but even more important than public debt is private debt. The ability of individuals and businesses to get low, low cost financing at very low interest rates, have that sold off into a secondary market, securitized, bought up by pension funds and other places around the world, which creates an enormous amount of liquidity, we get growth. We use these mechanisms now today at the local level to create growth, and the growth is so important to what we do because it provides us the money that we need to make good on all the things we want to do. This is kind of city administration 101, right? If you're not growing, you're dying. The places that are successful are the ones that are able to attract growth, attract jobs, and make things happen. There are some really powerful incentives at play here. When we get new growth with one of these mechanisms, the cost for us as local governments is generally pretty small. Yes, we may have to pay a little bit of matching dollars. We may have to upsize a pipe here and there. We may have some staff time. But when the state comes in with a program or the federal government comes in with a grant or the DOT comes in with a project or the private sector comes in and makes an investment, we pay a very small portion of that overall transaction. The benefit that we get, however, is substantial. Now we've got all this growth, we've got all this new tax revenue coming in. The catch is that we agree to take on the long-term responsibility 
of fixing and maintaining and servicing everything. We promise that we will fix that road, fix the curb, fix the pipe, fix the sidewalk, fix the pumps, fix the valves. We'll provide police protection and fire protection and school districts and all the other services that will be needed. We are, in a sense, exchanging a near-term benefit in cash for a long-term obligation. There's only one or two ways that this strategy makes any sense. Either growth is going to continue at ever-accelerating rates. In other words, we're always going to be able to create a whole bunch more new projects at very low cost to us today that we can generate and use that revenue then to make good on all the promises we made a generation ago. Or the pattern of development, the way we actually go about building our places, the way we actually go about assembling how we live is going to generate for us more wealth and prosperity than it generates cost. Everybody in this room understands that this first assumption is not true, right? Even if it was mathematically possible, which it's not, we, we've been through enough of this, right, where we know that we're not just going to grow at accelerating exponential rates forever. Unfortunately, this second assumption also is not true. And for a brief period of time here, I'm going to get a little bit technical with you. Uh, I've got to do some of that. I am an engineer. Uh, it won't be painful, I promise. One of the things that we did early on at Strong Towns was to say, there's got to be parts of our system that we can measure. As engineers, we kind of have what, what we now call at Strong Towns the quantum theory of economic development. Uh, this idea that, uh, well, if you look here, uh, you, you, you might be able to figure what's going on here. Uh, and it doesn't look good, and you look here and it doesn't look good, and you look here and it doesn't look good, but what you're really not doing is measuring the system as a whole. It's this, it's this massive system that makes everything work. And we kind of said, well, no, there are parts of the system that we should be able to measure that should show us kind of in a representative way what's actually going on. And so we, we hunted for those places. We looked for places that didn't have a lot of white noise, not a lot of background stuff going on. Uh, so we could get kind of an understanding of what was happening. This is the, the most basic one you're going to see. This is a dead end road with a cul-de-sac. There's no through traffic here. There's no commercial traffic here. There's nothing going on but a road that serves the people who live there. If the people did not live there, this road would not exist. It exists solely because they are there. When this was built in the mid-1990s, it was a gravel road. The city went out and paved it. The cost to do that was $6,600 per property. The city paid half and the property owners paid the other half. We asked the question, all right, based on the taxes being collected from the people within this development, the only people that are, will ever be there, ever going to be there, that this is it. How long is it going to take the city to recoup the money they spent to build that road? The answer is 37 years. Now, of course, the road's not going to last 37 years. And when it falls apart, it's 100% the city's responsibility to fix yet it's going to take that long for the city just to break even. This is a, another development. This one is a closed loop system. Again, no through traffic, no commercial traffic, just residential development. There's a dead end cul-de-sac up there. Uh, we, uh, this one was built in the 1980s. The developer paid all the costs, uh, wrapped up those costs in the mortgages when they were sold. So the costs were passed on to the property owners. They count that value as part of their home value today. They pay taxes every year, right? Uh, this road hit a point where it needed to be rebuilt. The city went out and did it. The cost was $354,000. We asked the question, based on the taxes being paid by the people within this development, the only people who are really are going to use this road in any substantive way, how long is it going to take the city to recoup the money they had to spend to fix it? The answer is 79 years. The road won't last anywhere near that long. So we said, all right, let's say the city wanted to try to collect between now and the time the road fell apart enough money from these property owners to actually fix the road. What would that mean? It would mean an immediate 46% increase in taxes and annual increases of 3% over inflation every year for the next 25 years with all that money just going to maintain the roadway. The sewer, the water, uh, vastly more expensive, right? Now, some of these people say, okay, Chuck, we get it. We know we lose money on residential. We make it up on commercial. Commercial is our cash cow. You guys 
have a little bit of that paradigm here, right? To which my response is always, okay, I don't know any corporation who loses money on 90% of what it does and tries to make it up on the last 10%. I don't know why an incorporated municipality would think that was a good strategy. Yet culturally, we've kind of told ourselves that maybe it doesn't really matter what happens with our residential property uh, as long as we can make it up on commercial. This is a business park. This one was built in the mid-1990s. The city felt this was so successful because every single lot was built upon that they wanted to build a new one right next door. They wanted to build the exact same thing, just repeat it, a mirror image right next door. We said, all right, if we can build the same thing at the same cost and get the same level of investment, would that be a good project? In today's dollars, it would cost $2.1 million to build. There's been $6.6 .6 million of investment that's taken place subsequently. Now, pause here for a sec. Of that investment that has happened, four of those lots are a church. Two of the lots belong to the school district. It's a bus maintenance facility. One of the lots is a county maintenance garage. One of the lots is a city maintenance garage. All of them are very important parts of the community, and I'm not denying that or minimizing that in any way, but none of them pay any taxes to the city, zero. Of the remaining lots, the ones that theoretically would be taxpayers, every single one was sold for a dollar and or was given a long-term tax subsidy in order to attract them to move into this park. For the sake of our analysis, we assumed that in the new park that was going to be built, every lot would be fully developed within 12 months by a non-subsidized tax-paying entity, and that every penny of revenue would go to retiring that bond. If that were the case, it would still take the city almost three decades, 29 years, just to break even. That's 29 years where everybody else's taxes would have to go up to plow the snow, mow the ditches, provide police protection, fire protection, and every other service that would be needed. And that is in the most wildly optimistic of scenarios. I used to go through and do like 15 of these. I, I was so proud of all the examples we had that I would go through and show people all of them. And you know, eventually people would start crying. And uh, <laughs> I found that I could make the point with just three if you're someone who likes case studies and data, we've got a bunch of these on our website. I'll, I'll give you that address at the end. Uh, but let me explain what's going on here. And, and again, I apologize. I'm an engineer. I like charts and graphs. I know some people don't. Uh, there's only four charts in this presentation, the next four slides. So I will walk you through them. Let's say that a developer comes to our town. It says, I have this piece of property I'd like to build upon. Uh, I am willing to build at my expense all of the houses, all the commercial properties. I will, to your standards, put in the roads and the streets and the curb and the sidewalks and the pipes and the pumps and the valves and the meters. I I'll do all that. I will meet all of your codes and regulations. I'm not asking for any variances or anything weird. And I'm not asking for any subsidies. The only thing that I'm asking as a developer is that when I'm done building this new thing, that you, the city, the public, agree that you will take over the long-term responsibility to fix and maintain all this. What would we say? We'd say fantastic, right? Like, like could there be a better deal, right? Like, this is, this is perfect. You don't want any subsidies. You're going to follow all of our rules. You'll pay all the cost. This is ideal. I was at a city council meeting once where this kind of something like this was presented. The council meeting, you mean we get a free road? Yeah, you get a free road. Free road. Let's say that we're prudent people. We've heard of this strong town stuff. We want to make sure we're doing the right thing. So what we're going to decide to do is that when the revenue from this new development comes in, we're going to take the portion that would normally get spent and other places maintaining other things. And we're going to set that aside. And every year when the money comes in, we're going to set that portion aside and we're going to allow it to accumulate so that when we get out a generation, we'll have a pot of money to make good on all these promises, all these promises that we're taking on. Here's what that looks like from a graph standpoint. In year one, everything is brand new. 
It's cost you nothing. The developer has paid for everything, <coughs> rolled it over into people's mortgages, and they're paying their mortgage to the bank. Costs you nothing. The money comes in, you take that portion and you set it aside. In year two, a little bit more money comes in, you add to what you had in year one. In year three, a little bit more money comes in and you add it. In year four, year five, and you can see a five-year-old road isn't costing you anything. A 10-year-old pipe isn't costing you anything. A 15-year-old sidewalk is not costing you anything. And so as you go out in a time, all you're doing is bringing money in and nothing's going out. You're feeling very, very wealthy here. And you get out a couple of decades and you've got quite a pile of cash sitting there. The problem is when you have to go and make good on that promise, in this case, year 25, when you have to make good on that promise you made way back in year one, what you find is that the cumulative amount of money you brought in is insufficient. And from a cash flow standpoint, you run far into the negative. Now, cities are not one development, right? Cities are a collection of developments, a collection of neighborhoods. So let's say that the developer comes back in a couple years later after that first development and says, you know, that worked out really well for me, worked out really well for you. I would like to do a similar size development again. And every other year from that point forward, developer comes in the door with a similar size development. In other words, the ideal scenario for any city, nice, steady, continuous growth. And we take that money and we set it aside and we save it for the day when we have to make good on all these promises that we're accumulating as we continue to grow. Here's what that looks like. In year one, you've got your first development that pays in. It pays in the entire 25 years shown here. Year three, now you've got another development paying in. Year five, you've got another. Year seven, you've got another. And you can see that your cash actually starts to kind of accelerate upwards. You've had all this growth. You have growth upon growth upon growth. You're starting to feel very, very rich. And when you get to year 25 and you have to make good on that promise you made way back in year one, yes, you've got to spend a little bit of money, but it's not a big deal, right? <coughs> you've had all this growth. The growth creates what we call the illusion of wealth. Because as we all intuitively understand, if you lose money on every transaction you do, you don't make it up in volume. If you lose money on every project that you undertake, the further you go out in the time horizon, the more downward pressure there is on your budget. This is the answer to that question. Why are cities struggling financially? And, you know, we try to answer that in our cultural, political paradigm in so many dysfunctional ways, right? Government's incompetent. People who work for government are lazy. We're not taxed enough. People are greedy. We have all these ways of excusing it and explaining it. When really, at the end of the day, what we have is an approach to building our places that destroys wealth. It costs more than the wealth it creates. This is human nature, right? Look at this. Can you see in this chart human nature? I mean, this is why people smoke, right? I'm smoking today because I have the benefits of oh, emphysema, <coughs> right? This is why we have that extra bowl of ice cream instead of going for a job, right? Oh, I'm going to enjoy some ice cream and a good TV show. Oh, no, heart disease, right? We, we place a high value on pleasure today and a very low value on pain in the future. That's the way humans are wired. There's nothing inherently bad or corrupt in this. This is human nature. Let me ask you a pivotal question. What happened to societies thousands of years ago that embarked upon an experiment like this. They went away. They were not copied. They did not become one of those experiments that was replicated over and over and over. They went away. We're in a different place today. No one has ever tried to do this. We are in a strange new world, in a huge experiment that is financially insolvent. And yes, we're going to go, I, I'm, I've been dreading 
2016 for a long time because the election years are like every four years I have this miserable time because we're going to be subjected to an insane narrative around this chart here, right? We're going to be subjected to an insane narrative that tries to explain it in terms of other people are taking your stuff or other people aren't doing enough when we're really not going to be talking about the fundamental problem that we have built places that don't make financial sense. I got one more chart and it's very important and then we're going to go on and talk about how we start thinking differently about our places. But it's this one here. This is a chart of debt. Everybody in this room is familiar with the narrative on our public debt, right? Our public debt is enormous, $18 trillion. I had two years of calculus. I'm not going to stand up here and pretend that I can understand what a trillion dollars is, right? You guys uh, had the weekly reader when you were kids in school? Um, when I was in fourth grade, we had the weekly reader. And I remember they had this little breakout bar said if you took the national debt and converted it into dollar bills, it would go to the moon and back like 23 times or something like that. You know? As if for a fourth grader, replacing one abstract concept with another <laughs> abstract concept <laughs> would clarify everything. Right? These are enormous, these are numbers beyond our ability to fathom. In this chart here, the bottom line, the blue one, that's the growth in our public sector debt. The black one right above it, that's our GDP, that's our economy. This green one, the one that soars up like that, that's the growth in our, our private sector debt. That's debt that we share. That's home mortgages, commercial real estate loans, auto loans, credit cards, margin interest accounts, student loans. Private sector debt. The way we paid for the first generation of this great experiment was to take our savings and to reinvest that illusion of wealth back into creating more growth. When things started to slow down, I think mid-70s, early 80s, things started, there started to be a drag, right? We had to fix things. We had to, you know, take care. It took us a while to figure out what to do. But we eventually shifted from an economy based on growth through savings and investment to an economy based on growth through debt accumulation. And growth through debt accumulation has become such an important part of our economy that we actually allowed it to become predatory. We actually allowed systems to arise that said, oh, you can't afford a house? Now you can. You can afford a small house? Well, now you can afford a large house. You can afford a large house? Well, now you can afford multiple large houses. We needed the growth so badly that we allowed our financial system to prey on our friends and neighbors. Our ability to continue this experiment by having our friends and neighbors take on accelerating levels of debt is just simply not there. Obviously, there's some huge implications to all of this. The mechanisms of growth that we become accustomed to are waning. The federal government does not have the ability whether they have the desire or not, to bail out every city that is in financial trouble. Do you see the federal government rushing to help Detroit? No. And they cannot help all of us. The state governments are vastly overcommitted. Minnesota is one of the best in terms of pension funds. Our pension fund is 70% funded. We have statewide pension for all public employees. We're 70% funded. We're one of the best. We have a 30% gap, and our projections for the future say we're going to have 8.5% growth in our portfolio forever. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have, at the end of the year, checked your portfolio for the last few years. <laughs> when you are a conservative pension fund with 60% of your holdings in 0% bonds, <laughs> you're not making 8.5%, right? We are the best. States are in no position to bail out all the cities that are going to be in financial trouble. Our DOTs are vastly overcommitted. We have built more lane miles than we have the potential revenue to maintain. You guys just did a... I'll say... You guys just did a strange, silly little thing to try to buy yourself some more time so you didn't have to make any hard choices or changes from your transportation funding standpoint. 
Uh, I would not have done that. I, we were opposed to that. We tried to explain why that wasn't a good idea. I get the trade-offs that happen. I want transit. I want roads. I want fiscal sanity. Uh, you're less important than we get, you know, this. Um, we're not going to be able to maintain everything we built. And so the idea that we're going to be able to build more and more and use that money to create growth in cities is just not a viable option. Our private sector is tapped out. We're not going to be able to borrow accelerating levels of debt, especially as students are graduating with the highest debt levels ever, and this huge generation of people we've referred to as the baby boom are entering the years of their life where they don't take on debt. What this means for us at the local level is that our cities are going to be forced to absorb the costs of our development pattern. If we want that road fixed, we have to pay for it. If we want that pipe repaired, that money is going to have to come from us. This can't be done in the current pattern of development without some incredibly large tax increases and or some devastatingly large cuts in services. Now, I didn't come here to tell you what you already know, right? Everybody in this room is familiar with the narrative, the, the debate we're having at every level of government. How big is the tax increase going to be? Who should pay for it? How deep is the service cut going to be, and where should that be felt? It is critical, as we sit here today, that we see the third variable in that sentence. The third variable being the current pattern development. As long as we continue to build in a way that is functionally insolvent, there is no way that our cities are going to avoid insolvency. As long as we continue to build in a pattern that gives us an illusion of wealth today in exchange for enormous long-term liabilities, there's no way that our cities are going to avoid default. Whether that is a hard default, like we see in places like Stockton and San Bernardino and Detroit, or whether it's a soft default, like we see in thousands of cities across this country, where they're laying off firefighters and police officers, they're closing libraries, they're not maintaining parks, they're putting off critical maintenance and taking on lots and lots of debt. We have to start having a conversation about how we build places that are financially productive. So how do we do this? It was back in 2012 that I actually did a, what we call it, a tour of California. We put out a thing and said, uh, we're going to come to California. Who would like us to come and do a talk? Started in Redding and went down to San Diego and gave 12 talks in five days. It's a great trip. Uh, it was my first trip doing this outside of Minnesota. So there's a lot of uh, affirmation that what we were seeing in California, which is the craziest of the crazy in many ways for this kind of thing. Uh, but what we kept running into when I would get done, there was someone from the audience would always stand up and say, Chuck. I am really angry with you. You have come here and scared the heck out of us, but you didn't tell us the solution to these problems. What is the solution? What, what are we supposed to do? And it took me a while. I was really frustrated because we're going to talk about what we do differently now. Talk about how we think differently, how we approach these problems differently, how we do things differently. But I wasn't answering their question. What's the solution? And it took me a while to realize that I was, I was hearing them wrong. I was hearing them ask, what's the solution? What they were really asking was something fundamentally different. What they were really asking was, what can someone else change about what they're doing so that I don't have to change anything about what I'm doing? <laughs> we have tried all of those solutions. right? We have tried all of those. This year we will be bombarded with a whole series of political uh, dialogues about those kind of solutions. right? At Strong Dads, we don't talk about solutions. These problems cannot be solved. What we talk about are rational responses. How do we, as smart, thoughtful, intelligent, rational people, living together in a community, step back and look at this complex set of problems and respond to them as rational, thoughtful people? Whenever we talk about rational responses, I always start here. This, again, is my hometown back in the early 1900s. And I, I'm just, I wish we could get this light shut off because I want you to see like the depth of this photo. I, 
I love, when I first saw this, I was just blown away, right? Just blown away. Because look at this place. As a, as a planner, I looked at this and I said, wow, look, look at the way the buildings line up, the way they frame the public realm at just the exact like Greco-Roman ratios. This is beautiful. There's great segmentation of the public realm. The buildings have great symmetry. This is, a, this is an exquisitely designed place. <clears throat> Let me ask you a few questions. And I get myself in trouble with planners in this part. So don't, don't, don't get your defenses up, all right? Let me ask you some questions. How thick was their zoning coat? How many boards and committees did you have to go to in this city to get an approval to build something? How many grants did they give out? How much tax subsidy did they have? How many federal and state programs were there to help them with growth and jobs? How many miles of pipe and road did they build in order to attract growth and development, right? We can go through the litany of things that we have convinced ourselves are so critically important to creating success. They had none of them. None of them. Yet look at what they built. These were a bunch of illiterate lumberjacks in the middle of nowhere. They didn't even have 30-year mortgages. How did they do this? How did they do this? It's really simple. They just copied what they knew worked. They took the materials they had on hand and they built in a style and a pattern and a framework that they had seen work for thousands and thousands of years. They copied what they knew worked. After 60 years, 70 years of planners telling, you know, here's how we should do things to create growth, after all the engineering advice, all the economic development officials, all the codes and books and grants and subsidies to create jobs and growth, this exact same street today looks like this. It's a wasteland of parking lots and half-occupied buildings. And if you want to understand in one snapshot why our cities are struggling financially, understand that there's a half million dollars of public infrastructure in that little stretch of street right there. Where is the wealth that is going to sustain that generation after generation after generation? I was giving a, a lecture at a university in Boise, Idaho, and I, I got to this slide and a student raised their hand, stood up, said, Chuck, uh, I'm from Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a very poor country. We can't afford to build the way that you build here in America. When we build, we have to build one block at a time. And before we can build the next block, we have to make sure that every gap on the block we just built is filled in. Otherwise, we won't be able to afford it. We're a very poor country. We can't afford to build this way. We're a very poor country now, too. We can't afford to build this way either. And for a long time, that illusion of wealth made us think that this kind of thing didn't matter. That we could have blocks and blocks and miles and miles of stuff that didn't make any financial sense and it didn't matter because we were so wealthy we didn't even have to bother to think about it. We're now a poor country again and we now have to actually start thinking. So how do we think again? The first thing we gotta do is get rid of the worst habits that we've got. The worst habit we have is this. Build it and they will come. Build it and they will come is a fantastic movie plot. It has everything, right? Baseball, cornfields, Iowa. It is a great movie plot. It is a horrible economic <coughs> development strategy. We are in, at Strong Towns, what we call the desperation phase of the suburban experiment. In the desperation phase of the suburban experiment, what do you have to do to be a player in the game? You have to be willing to give away the store, right? You've got to have a team of people on staff ready to hand out subsidies if Google should troll through town, right? You've got to have shovel-ready sites and shovel-ready projects, and you've got to have everything ready to go if the federal manna should drop from heaven, right? We, we know how this works. It's a desperation for more growth. This is not how cities build wealth. This is not how cities have ever built wealth. I'm going to show you now the very simple way in which cities build wealth. 
Does this place look familiar to any of you? Take a close look. That's a lot better. If I told you this was Seattle, would that shock you? There's probably a picture of Seattle if we went back far enough that looks like this, right? If I told you this was Olympia, would this surprise you? You know, there's probably a photo of Olympia somewhere at the Historical Society here that looks just like this, right? If I said this was LA, you'd have a hard time with that because the wrong architecture, wrong trees, yeah. If I said this was Chicago, you could, you could buy that, right? Minneapolis. Uh, I could say this was Manhattan. You know, there, there wasn't a photo at the time Manhattan was found, but we all understand that at one point in history, Manhattan looked like this too, right? San Francisco, Vancouver. The trees are wrong for Dallas or Houston, but you know, at some point they looked like this too. We could go back far enough and, and this could be London or Paris or Rome, right? They all started just like this. This could be Romulus and Remus standing in this photo, right? Every city that was ever started before our current experimental way of building began just like this. A little hope and a dream, right? This is my hometown. This is what Brainerd, Minnesota looked like in 1870. 30 years later, this street would become this street. This is what it looked like at the beginning. We built thousands of these across this continent. And for a variety of complex reasons, emergent reasons, reasons that defy our ability to explain, defy our ability to even fully understand, a lot of these places failed. What happens when a place like this fails? Does the stock market drop by 20%? Does your pension fund go underwater? Do we have to have a, a bailout of Wall Street banks? No. These are little bets. A few people lose a little bit of money, they salvage what they can, and they move on to the next place. We built thousands of these around this country. And for a variety of complex reasons, reasons that are emergent, that defy our ability to comprehend or even fully explain after the fact, a lot of these places were successful. When they were successful, a very simple mechanism happened. They would start to grow incrementally. They would grow incrementally up, incrementally out, and become incrementally more intense. And so after 30 years of incremental development, this little block of pop-up shacks would become that block of two and three story wood buildings. And after another 40 years of incrementally growing up, <coughs> incrementally growing out, and incrementally becoming more intense, these wood structures would be replaced with buildings of brick and granite. We don't build wealth by going to the casino and putting it all on red. The way we build wealth is by making small investments over a broad area over a long period of time. I'm going to show you how powerful this style of development is. These are two identical blocks in my hometown. The one on the left I've labeled old and blighted. The one on the right I've labeled shiny and new. If you look at them from this perspective, you can see they're the exact same. They have, have the same neighborhood, the same thoroughfare. They're the same size, the same area. They have the same amount of public infrastructure. Everything about them is the same except for the style of development upon them. That old and blighted block looks like this. It's a pop-up block of the 1920s. As my city was growing incrementally, the next increment of out in the 1920s were these three blocks. So what you're looking at here is the cheapest building that you would have been allowed to build in the 1920s. And the people building these buildings, they were you know, bootstrapping Americans, trying to make something happen. The idea would have been as the city continued to grow incrementally, they would have added a second story, added a third story, you know, combined with the neighboring property, become more intense over time as things became more successful. That's not what happened, right? Because after these were built, we had the Depression, we had World War II, we had a completely different style of development that made these people losers because we skipped right over them and started building out on the edge of the city. These, these three blocks have stagnated for 90 years. Two blocks over used to look just like this. The city had it torn down, and now we have a brand new taco drive through <laughs> This was enormous progress, right? 
We got rid of blight. We now have something that meets all of our codes. This meets the parking ordinance, meets the sign ordinance. It's got the right floor area ratios, the right amount of green space. The environmental people were happy because they actually have native plants now in the stormwater area. The engineer was happy because we got rid of that nasty on-street parking and now the traffic can flow more smoothly. The bike people were even happy. The ped people, because they got a sidewalk. The sidewalk ends right there, but they got that little stretch, right? <laughs> Here's what nobody bothered to consider. That old and blighted rundown block has a total value of $1.1 million. That shiny new block, the same size area, the same amount of public infrastructure, just a different style of development, only worth $800,000. The city's actually getting 42% more taxes from that old, rundown, junky block. Understand what you're looking at. You're looking at the traditional development pattern, the way we built places for thousands of years across different continents and different latitudes and different cultures. You're looking at that in its infancy after 90 years of neglect, and it outperforms by a wide margin the stuff we build brand new today. And we all know the trajectory of the taco joint, right? 20 years from now, there'll be a new taco joint a mile up the road. This one will be a used car lot. 10 years later, it will be boarded up. They'll be selling meth out the back, and we'll be trying to like, get a grant to get it torn down, right? We've all been around long enough to see this happen. In fact, we did this analysis initially in 2012. Here's what happened in the following years. Let me ask, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to do this one today because I love doing this and I think this is a group that will get this. Um, think for a second. Your job, is to make, your job is to make properties in the city more valuable. And you realize you don't have any money. You can't throw money at your problems. You've got to work with small increments of change. Take a look at that old blighted rundown block and tell me some of the things you would do to make that block over the next decade or two a better place to be, a more valuable place, a place that is going to be financially uh, improved in value. What, what are some of the things you would do? Go ahead and just shout them out. Street trees. We put in some trees. This, this is actually south facing. The sun comes right in there. Some street trees would actually aesthetically look great and also serve a real good function. Awnings. We could fix up the front of those facades. They're kind of nasty. It wouldn't cost a lot of money. That's a great idea. Clean the sidewalk. You know what? Why don't we go sweep the sidewalk? That's not a big <laughs> deal, right? We could do that. That's within our ability to do. Anybody else? It looks like they need a bike rack. <laughs> um, those are bikes for sale uh, at the pawn shop. There actually is not a bike rack there is one bike rack in the city of Brainerd that I'm aware of. Okay? We, you know what? The lighting there is that highway nasty stuff. We could do something a little bit nicer with that. Do you guys see what we're doing here? Right? Like we could change the code so that they could actually legally have a second story where people could live. Right? There's, there's all kinds of things that we could do. We could go out on the street, pick 40 people at random, put them in a room and say, You've got two hours to come up with 50 ideas that we could do to make these properties more valuable, and we come back in two hours and they would have a whole long list of things we could try, right? Tell me what you would do to improve the value of that taco gym. You don't have a lot of money. You can't throw money at this problem. You can't go buy it. You can't force them to do things they don't want to do. What would you do? I have no idea. There's people working on this, and they, they call it sprawl repair and things like that. But when you actually get into it, they're talking about things that would cost millions. Like in a marketplace, are so uneconomical. They, they make no sense, except in like the most extreme of circumstances, right? Just a, a, a run-of-the-mill thing like this is never going to get touched. It's, 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 there's no way it feasi it's economically feasible. What do you do? Raise the minimum wage so the payroll tax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, marijuana. That might be the answer. Yeah. Oh, we need to hire you. Put in a lawn tennis 
In that old and blighted block, you have a development style that has tremendous financial upside and very limited financial downside. That's why our ancestors built this way, right? It's a lot of upside and very little downside. In our new experimental approach, we have a development pattern that has very limited financial upside and a downside that we routinely see go negative. This is the same kind of thing we see on the edge of our cities. This is our Mills Fleet Farm complex. We're talking a little bit Mills Fleet Farm at lunch. Uh, for those of you, I know you don't have Mills here. Um, Mills Fleet Farm is like a Midwestern big box kind of place, really, really popular in Minnesota. Brainerd is the home of Mills Fleet Farm. So we have the biggest one in the world. This is a double-sized big box store. When you walk in your typical Mills store, you have uh, auto parts, animal feed, uh, lumber, guns and ammo, camouflage lingerie. That's the, <laughs> that's the product mix. Wildly successful. This is a 19-acre piece of property with a double-sized big box. Uh, auto dealership and gas station. This is the most valuable piece of property in the entire Brainerd Lakes area. When these people show up to a meeting, we just stop the meeting and say, you know, what can we do for you, right? This is 19 acres of our downtown. Uh, if you have seen the movie Fargo, you have seen uh, a not so flattering, but not so inaccurate portrayal of downtown Brainerd. Uh, in my life, there has not been a single new building built. Quite a few have burned down and are now parking lots. Uh, most of the second, third stories are unoccupied. The first stories tend to have high turnover. This is not a very successful place. Yet when we step back and we look out on the edge of town at that 19 acres, we're getting a taxable value of 0.6 million per acre. But when we go downtown, the same 19 acres, just a different configuration, uh, we're getting a value 78% greater. The city actually collects 78% more taxes both property and sales tax from the downtown than they collect from the best of the best out on the edge. Now, how much do we spend to get the best of the best on the edge? Well, we spent over $100 million on the bypass. Uh, we spent tens of millions to get sewer and water just out uh, to this little point out here. When I was an engineer, I designed the road actually behind this. So back in the 90s, the city spent $2.5 million to build that millions more for the frontage roads, the other roads around. We spent millions and millions to build this. How much did my generation spend to get this 19 acres of wealth in the downtown? Nothing, right? That was wealth that my great-great-grandparents and their contemporaries <coughs> built slowly and incrementally over time and then bequeathed to us as kind of a community endowment, right? Something that would pay back year after year after year. And we've kind of slowly milked it down. <clears throat> what happens when Mills Fleet Farm goes out of business? It will happen at some point, right? We do not have the Hudson Bay Company anymore. <coughs> Companies have a life cycle. It will go out of business. It will, it will be gone from this site. What happens then? What is the reuse of this site? I have no idea. But based on things we see in other places, we can kind of confidently say that whatever it is will not be as valuable as it is today. This is the peak. What happens when there's 134 different properties in the downtown? What happens when one of them loses a tenant? Or someone goes out of business or moves out of town? What happens? What happens when we figure out that we're not as smart as we think we are from a zoning standpoint and, oh, we just don't have enough office space. We have too much residential. Well, some of that residential apartments get converted into offices, right? What happens when we're not as smart as we think we are and, wow, we have too much office and not enough residential? Well, some of the offices get converted into residences. This is a platform for building that is very flexible, very adaptable, very resilient. We don't have to be geniuses or prescient to make this work. There's a reason our ancestors built this way. And I say ancestors in the biggest sense of the word. Our ancestors for thousands of years around the world. These micro analysis we see reflected in the macro. So this is an analysis that a good friend of mine named Joe Minicosi and his group at Urban 3 have done. 
This is of the city of Buffalo. I choose Buffalo because Buffalo is one of those cities that has hollowed out after World War II. They have lost population in every census since 1940. Yet when we look at Buffalo and we say, where is the wealth in Buffalo? What I'm going to show you uh, is a third dimension now that shows value per acre. Okay? I showed you the Taco John's. I showed you the Fleet Farm. Now I'm going to show you this on a citywide basis. If you think of like a farm field, when we go out and we plant seed in a field, some areas grow up really tall, some not as tall. The ones that grow up really tall, we say that has high productivity. So what we're asking here is where's the financial productivity in our community? Where's the places that are generating the most tax revenue per acre? And in Buffalo, uh, can you point out where the historic downtown is? The place that's been hollowed out. The place where all the poor people live. And not only is it produce more wealth than everything around it, but it does it in huge magnitudes more. It's far more productive. There's far more margin for error, in a sense. We can go to smaller cities. This one in upstate New York, uh, of around 30,000 people. We see the same kind of thing. The historical, walkable, traditional development pattern pays many multi multiples of everything else. We can go very small. This is a, a little city by where I live, city of Crosby. It's about 1,200 people. When I first went to this city, they said, Chuck, we've got some really great stuff going on out here and out here. I'll show you out here. We've got great stuff going on out here and out here. But these neighborhoods in here are just terrible. The stuff going on in there, we've got to get rid of it. We've got to replace that with stuff that actually uh, it performs well. And then we showed them where all their wealth was. It's in the neighborhoods with the poor people the neighborhoods that they discount, the neighborhoods that they don't think are good. Those places were built slowly and incrementally over time and still are paying back huge amounts to the community. We uh, have done this analysis in, in hundreds of cities. I think we're approaching 1,000 now across the country. Joe's team, and I'm saying we, including myself and Joe's team, Joe's team is doing amazing work. Uh, and we've been able to partner with him on a number of things, but he's done this all over the country, and it shows up the same every time. When you start looking at financial productivity, what you see is that tra the traditional development pattern uh, is where it is, and it is by wide margins of error, wide margins of error. These tend to be the poorest neighborhoods. These tend to be the places where the most disenfranchised people live. They're paying the highest level of taxes and demanding really the least level of expense and services. But we were able to do something very special in the city of Lafayette. In the city of Lafayette, uh, we were not just able to take revenue and look at this, but we were actually able to look at their expenses. So how much does it cost to fix that pipe? How much does it cost to provide fire protection here? How much does it cost to pump your sewage from there to there? How much does it cost to maintain your cul-de-sac? We were able to look at all of these things and put together this aggregate map. Now, I've come to realize that some people have red, green, colorblind. Uh, if you're one of those, this map is not making much sense to you right now. And I apologize for that. Uh, I'm not the map maker, so I can't actually just change this. But there's a change in progress. But let me, let me walk you through it. For those of you that are not red, green, colorblind and do see red and green, uh, everywhere you see red is a place where a parcel is costing the city more money than paying in taxes. And the degree that it goes up uh, is, is the disparity. So the higher up, the more the disparity. Where you see green, that's where a parcel is actually generating more revenue to the city than it costs the city to service and maintain that parcel. And again, the higher it goes up, the more the disparity. Uh, for every, I will walk you now through, can I, if I do it just over here, is that gonna be okay for all of you? You can stand up and look. Um, I'm gonna, I'm using a red pointer. That's not gonna help. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to walk over here and do it. This is a really important map. Okay, so here's what you've got in Lafayette. Where I have my hand right now is green. Those all go up like that. That is their historic downtown. Have you ever been to downtown Lafayette? Not a great place. It's okay. It's got a couple nice restaurants, firehouses down there. There's a little park. 
There's some potential, but it's not, it's not like killing it, right? You wouldn't go there and say, oh, Lafayette has a fantastic downtown. It's okay, getting a lot better. Out here, you have a new urbanist development that's relatively new. The way I would describe this, the way I have described it is, you have traditional development practices with modern financing. Whether that will be sustained and maintained over a long period of time as things age, as things wear, all those streets are gonna go bad at the same time, all the roofs on the houses are gonna go bad at the same time, because it's all built at the same time. We'll see whether this maintains its dominance, but right now it's one of the best places out there. This little ring of green right here, there's a little ring right through here, those are the poor neighborhoods. Those are the neighborhoods where when you go to stay in Lafayette, they say, mm, don't get a place over there. In fact, don't go over there. Those are the places where they have the highest homicide rate, the highest burglary rate, the crime rate. It's in these neighborhoods right here, that's where all the poor people live. They're generating tons of revenue compared to the expense we're seeing in that neighborhood. Out here on the edge, here's where you've got your red. So this is very extremely red, extreme red. Out here you've got red. Up there, at the top you've got red. What are those places? Those are the big box stores. Those are the strip malls. Those are the subdivisions with the cul-de-sacs and the three-car garages. For the most part, those are where the affluent people live. There's two subsidies in this map. And we see this repeated again and again and again in cities all over this country. Subsidy number one is from the poor neighborhoods to the wealthy neighborhoods. Subsidy number two is from the future residents of Lafayette to today's residents. Future residents have taken on the liability to make good on all these promises even though the money's not there to do it. And they will have to deal with that financial problem. They're already starting to deal with it because right now they have a backlog of $42 million for road maintenance. Their annual road maintenance budget, $300,000. So there are roads that are not getting fixed and will never get fixed because they don't have the money to do it. They built too much. I'm gonna give you a sense of what this means in dollar terms to real people. Uh, if you are, uh, live in the median house, which is $150,000 in Lafayette, uh, you pay about $1,500 a year in taxes. Uh, about 150 of that goes to roads. If you wanted to fully pay to maintain all the roads in the city, in other words, if the city were gonna make good on all its obligations, you would need to pay an additional $3,300 per year. And if you were gonna maintain all of the uh, stormwater, uh, sewer, water systems, which if you know anything about Lafayette, they're in a swamp, so stormwater systems are kind of important. Uh, that would be another 4,000 a year. So in order for you to make good on all the promises that are inherent in your development pattern in Lafayette, your taxes would need to go from $1,500 a year to uh, 87.50 or 86.50. That's never gonna happen. It's never gonna happen. What are the implications of that? A lot of the stuff they've built is never gonna be fixed. A lot of stuff they build is never gonna be fixed. I'm gonna show you something that is kinda of cool from a graphic standpoint, but really disturbing from like an implication standpoint, uh, particularly when you realize that the numbers out here in the Northwest and really on the West Coast, because you don't have a lot of the old stuff, but you have a lot of the new stuff, your numbers are even worse than this. Um, let me show you what it looks like in Lafayette, where they do have a, a fairly good mix of the old and the new. Uh, we look back and we can see that right after World War II, uh, the population in Lafayette was around 33,000. Uh, when we look at the pipe, there was about five feet of pipe per person. So over the course of a lifetime, your uh, excess wealth would, on average, need to generate enough to maintain five feet of pipe. Okay, that was kind of your responsibility in, in like the collective big thing of, of running this city. When we look at hydrants, we see that there were 2.4 hydrants for every thousand people. Okay, and so your responsibility with a thousand other people was to maintain 2.4 hydrants. When we fast forward to today, the population has jumped by three and a half times from 33,000 to 121,000. 
but the feet of pipe per person has gone up 10 times. So now the average person is responsible for maintaining 50 feet of pipe. If you're a family of four, your excess wealth would have to be enough to support over a generation the maintenance of 200 feet of pipe. Hydrants have gone up 24 or 21.4 times. So now 51.3 hydrants per thousand people. Now you could look at this and say, well, okay, Chuck, that's fine. But you know, yes, we have spread out and we put people all over the place, but we're a lot wealthier now. We're, you know, this is like America. This is the post-war. We won World War II. We were not devastated. We grew, you know, we, we, it's all about growth. We're just richer and wealthier now so we can afford a higher standard of living. That might be true, only while population in Lafayette's gone up three and a half times, your liabilities underground have gone up 10 and 20 times. Incomes in families have only gone up 60%, 1.6 times. So we're not wealthier. We're actually not wealthier. We're a little bit wealthier. We're not that wealthier. When we start to look at some of these places, we can get a sense of what a strategy is to try to deal with this. Um, these are from a city in North Carolina where you've got a Kmart at 384,000 an acre. You've got a Walmart at 967,000 an acre. Um, I choose these because this city was so proud of these. They had just put in a new interchange. They had spent $10 million running sewer water out here. They subsidized these places for the growth potential and all the sales tax revenue they were going to get. When we go to the same city in their downtown, you've got an old warehouse converted into a supper club at $5 million an acre. And my favorite, Jimmy's Pizza, $3.4 million per acre. When you step back and you look at the places you live, and you actually imagine getting out of your car and walking around and being in these places, you'll see the enormous gaps, all this stuff spread out in just insane ways. When you start to try to walk between them and you realize that places that we call built out today, the, the notion of, if anyone tells you that some place is built out, you know they are massively ignorant and do not understand reality. And, and the, the first cure is to get them out of their car and have them walk around and see just how much unused space there is in our cities, even in places that are built out by our standards. But here's the question. This is really the key question for you leaving this room today. Do the people here in Olympia, in Washington, do you guys have what it takes? Do you have the wherewithal, the ability, the technical skill and expertise to build something as exquisite and refined as Jimmy's Pizza? <laughs> because if you do, if you do have that level of competence, look at the wealth you can start to create. Look at the wealth you can start to build in all of your communities. Because you have tons of space for that. Tons of space for that. And when we start thinking about the implications of Jimmy's Pizza, right, we see that, you know, where do the profits go for these places? I often get people who want me to come and speak poorly about Walmart and try to stop a Walmart in their community. I'm like, I, that's not what we're about. It's not what we're about. Walmart is not, the, Walmart is not the bad guy. Walmart is the perfectly adapted corporation for the development pattern that we have created. They have perfectly adapted themselves to the system that we have set up. If you don't like Walmart, it's not that you don't like Walmart. You don't like the system we have set up. That's the problem. When the Walmart comes to town and says, we want to build here because you've created the perfect ideal environment for us, you have to change the environment. They're responding to you. Where do the profits in Jimmy's Pizza go? Jimmy, right? We all know Jimmy. Jimmy goes to church with us. Jimmy's kids go to school with us. His profits will pay for his kids to go to school, to go to college, right? We get that. We understand that. Where, where does Jimmy do his advertising? Right? Who's Jimmy's accountant? Where does he bank? When we start going through all the problems that are being thrown in our face, like a gap between the rich and the poor, uh, you know, 
economic opportunity. We've got to have entrepreneurs and the ability to bootstrap. It's all right there. It's all right there in Jimmy's Pizza, right? But we look with disdain on it. It's like beneath us. I wouldn't do something that, you know, we'll write code so we don't get Jimmy's Pizza. And we don't want something like that. But yet, if we realize that that is just the first increment of success, and you've got to go through the first increment of success to get to the second and the third, we should be building these kind of places everywhere. Here's the last thought, and it ties directly into Jimmy's Pizza. There's an adage that comes from Silicon Valley that goes like this. Innovation that happens from the top down tends to be orderly but dumb, while innovation that happens from the bottom up tends to be chaotic but smart. Our initial reaction to this is we want smart, we don't want dumb. But we have a really strong preference, particularly as an affluent society, for order over chaos. A really strong preference. If you've ever sat at a traffic light at midnight, you know that you're willing to tolerate a lot of stupid in order to have order, right? <laughs> Let me show you what this looks like from a city standpoint. This is Memphis, Tennessee. Memphis, Tennessee is a, a, a great place, full of great people, doing wonderful things. I've been fortunate enough to work with Memphis, Tennessee. I, I love this place. But Memphis, Tennessee shows up on all the desperation statistics, right? They're right there with Detroit. Homicide rate, out of wedlock births, poverty rates, what have you. They're one, two, two, one with Detroit all the time. This is a, this is a hard place. Memphis, post-World War II, did everything they were supposed to do to create prosperity. They ran the highways through the middle of the city. They ripped down buildings to make it happen. They ripped down buildings to create parking lots. They ripped out the streetcar lines. They ran highways through the middle of their neighborhoods. They identified neighborhoods they thought weren't up to standard. They moved those people out. They ripped up those neighborhoods and rebuilt things they thought would be better. They kept growing out and out and out, annexing more property, extending water and sewer. They eventually built a beltway. They kept growing out and out further. They eventually built a second beltway. They subsidized businesses to move to Memphis. They subsidized businesses to stay in Memphis. And at one point, they decided that what they needed in order to be a world-class successful city was an NBA basketball team playing in a pyramid-shaped stadium down on the Mississippi River. <laughs> So they went and built a stadium and then went searching for a team. Now you guys know what team they got, right? They got Vancouver, right? The Grizzlies are now the Memphis Grizzlies, which as someone who like, understands what a grizzly bear is, that's kind of a ridiculous thing. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, they're the Memphis Grizzlies. They're very, very proud of their team. The only problem is when the Memphis Grizzlies came to town, they didn't like this stadium. So the city wound up building them a new stadium a few blocks away from here. This one sat empty for 15 years. After $200 million of subsidy from the state and the local governments, it is now a Bass Pro Shop. <laughs> Orderly but dumb. Let me show you chaotic but smart. This is also in Memphis, Tennessee. This is a little street called Broad Avenue. Broad Avenue used to be a streetcar stop. Uh, the city ripped out the streetcar line, ran a highway through the middle of the neighborhood. Without the streetcar traffic, without the foot traffic through the neighborhood, this, these blocks just died. Some residents, fed up with the decline, fed up with the neglect, went out and took matters into their own hands. They swept up the sidewalks. They worked with the landlords to get the stores swept out. They painted their own bike lanes. They put in their own crosswalks. For one weekend, they invited businesses to come in and open up and just show people what this place could be. They had an art gallery, they had a bike repair shop, they had a couple food stands. And when they got done, it wasn't the greatest street in all of Memphis, but it was a lot better than what was there to begin with. And for one weekend, they just tried to show people what was possible. I wasn't here for this, but I did get out here six months after this. When I was out here six months after this, every single storefront was now occupied. The landlord of a building, one of the buildings, told me he was able to charge double the amount of rent after the project than what they were asking for years before the project. 
the city has gone out and documented 12, uh, they've documented 18 new businesses, 32 new jobs, and $12 million of property value appreciation for a total public investment of what? Zero. That's chaotic, but smart. Now, I don't know what your city would do if you went out and, and started doing this, right? I can tell you what my city would do. My city would be out Monday morning. Uh, you'd have the, you know, the city engineer with the code book saying, this doesn't meet our standard for a crosswalk. <laughs> you'd have the, the city attorney who would say, well, we potentially have some liability here. Get the power washers out and let's get rid of this. And then they'd send the police chief over to my office to give me a ticket, right? We have very little tolerance for chaos. The city of Memphis is smart. They're desperate, and their desperation has made them really smart. So what did they do? They went out with power washers, but they went out with power washers only after they had a plan to put this back permanently. You see, in Memphis, they realized that they could have all the public hearings they wanted, all the surveys, all the sticker charts on the walls and visioning sessions, and they never would have identified this as a high return investment. But their residents did. And so now their job is to never let it go back. So they went out there with power washers, they got rid of all this, and they put it back permanently. When they were out there, Memphis is desperate, remember? Their desperation has made them really smart. What did they do? They said, well, we're out here, we got the truck, we got the paint, paint's pretty cheap. Maybe we could do this, you know, a couple blocks in each direction. See if some of the love going on here can ooze into the surrounding neighborhood. It's not going to cost us much, but if it works out, look what could happen. They started doing other things. The highway that goes through the neighborhood is being reconstructed. They stopped the project and they said, we got some stuff going on here. Let's see if these two blocks, we can narrow it up and make it a little bit more friendly for people in this neighborhood. We're not going to build millions of dollars of tunnels and overpasses. Let's just see if we can do a little bit to nudge this along. Chaotic but smart. In my hometown, we were so inspired by Memphis, we went and did a project in that neighborhood with the taco joint and the old and blighted block. We spent a year working in this neighborhood just trying out different things. We'd, we'd paint crosswalks. We'd put in bike lanes. We'd monitor how traffic changed and how people used it. We spent a lot of time just observing where people struggled. Saw the mom walking through the ditch with the weeds up to her waist, pushing a stroller. What are you doing? I've got to go to the store. I've got to get milk. I don't have a car today. Uh, it's not safe to walk. I don't feel safe walking out there, so I'm, wa I'm walking here. Saw the elderly woman walking with the walker in the middle of the street, climbing over snowbanks. What, what are you doing? I have to get to the pharmacy today. I can't drive. The sidewalk is not shoveled, and so I have to walk out here. We started to document these. We started to ask some questions. Where are people struggling in this neighborhood? What can we do to fix this? And at the end of a year, we came up with this report called Neighborhoods First. It detailed eight projects that the city could do to make life a little bit better for the people who live there. The idea being that if we make this a little bit better neighbor to live in, neighborhood to live in, more people will want to live there. It will raise the value of the properties, and we can start that virtuous cycle of incremental investment. My city right now is doing a project, $7.2 million, to run sewer and water a mile and a half out of town to create a new business park at the airport. We already have a business park. We built in the 90s, it's only half full. But this would be an air-oriented business park. We could get a state grant to do it, and so that's our number one high-priority project. It's going to create jobs and growth and trickle down and make everybody better off, right? Been here many times. The total cost of our eight projects... $16,700. Put a crosswalk in here. Put a bike lane in here. Plant a row of trees along here. Little tiny things. What happens if my city goes out and does $16,700 worth of projects, little things in this neighborhood, and nothing happens? The neighborhood's not any better. It's not improved in any way. Nobody enjoys living there anymore. Nobody wants to move there or invest there. What if just nothing? Well, we're out $16,700, right? But we learned eight things that didn't work. Next year, we can go out and try eight new things, right? And see what will work. 
But I have a sense that they'll, you know, the things we're suggesting are gonna make things better. I went to the city engineer and I said, you know, I, I think you could use a sidewalk here. He said, why would you say that, Chuck? <laughs> we will never find the high return investments in our community from behind a desk. We'll never find them by holding a public hearing or a visioning session. The only way we'll find them is to go out in our communities, be present there, observe people, and observe where they struggle, and ask ourselves a very basic question. What is the next smallest thing we can do to address that struggle? And if we do that in neighborhood after neighborhood after neighborhood, year after year after year, not only will we be making the highest financially returning investments that we can possibly make, but we won't help but make people's lives better in the process. Thank you so much. Sometimes I go on and you guys like, you know, when I, when I stand up here and I look in your eyes and I can see that you're with it, I tend to elaborate a little more. And so I did that a little bit extra today. So we've kind of gone a little long. I know we've got some time. Uh, a couple quick things and then I'm happy to take any questions and we'll, we'll chat as long as we do have time. Um, there's a little card that I handed out. If you don't have one, they're in the back. Uh, my staff would get mad at me if I didn't say this. Um, we do a follow-up session to this. So what's going to happen is that we're going to talk now for a while and then you're going to go home and you're going to go, oh my gosh, I wish I had asked this question. In like a week or two, we're going to have a session online uh, that's just Q&A. And we invite people who attend these chats to come to that Q&A and just be part of it. Uh, so if you have, if you want to be notified of that, just fill out that form and get it to me or put it in the back when you leave and uh, we'll make sure you get invited to that. We have a registration list. And we got a registration list we can send you out to. Um, our website is strongtowns.org. If you go there, you will get a constant stream of content and stuff uh, that will help with this message. We license everything under Creative Commons. The idea being, we want you to share our message in whatever way works for you. If that means you want to print, you think something we wrote was brilliant and you want to print it off and put your name on it and send it to the paper, totally fine. <laughs> if you're working for an entity and you want to be like a brilliant planner and you say, wow, this is really brilliant and you want to copy and paste it into your report, that's totally fine too. You're allowed to do that. We say, please do that. Um, we're a membership organization. So if you like what we do, if you want to support us, if you want to be connected to what we're doing, we would love for you to become a member. And then the last thing, uh, we put out a book a while back. We're actually putting on another one in a couple weeks. I'm so excited, but this one is good too. Um, this is kind of like a Strong Towns 101. They're 10 bucks each. We're just trying to cover our costs and get our message out in another way. If you are someone who enjoys reading, uh, they're also on Kindle and other eBooks, so you can get it there too, and it's half price there. Um, let's do some questions. Is there anybody who has something they want to talk about? Please. You were in the part of the discussion talking about how basically it's a Ponzi scheme in terms of the growth and that in the future something's going to have to contract. It sounds like it. I thought of Detroit and I thought of the things I've read about that. I was wondering if you, is that a kind of a model for the future? Or yeah. <laughs> yes. Detroit is your future. Um, <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's fascinating because everybody has a narrative for Detroit, right? If you are uh, on one side of the political spectrum, you'll say Detroit, or uh, forget politics. If, if, if you live in one world over here, you'll look at Detroit and you'll say corrupt government, uh, those people, um, you know, whatever your narrative is. If you, if you live in this world over here, you'll look at it and you'll say, uh, you know, mean corporations, uh, and bad unions or whatever it is. Everybody has a narrative for Detroit. My narrative for Detroit is simple. They destroyed their resiliency. They went down this path that we described in the Ponzi scheme. They uh, chased after short-term growth with this new experiment and 
they arrived at the final destination ahead of everybody else. And all the things that made Detroit unique and difficult, corruption and government, unions, greedy comp auto companies, wh whatever your narrative is that was like the straw that broke the camel's back, the camel's back was completely weakened and wiped out because of this like crazy way we built. There's no resiliency, there's no ability to bounce back and overcome because they had left themselves no margin for error, right? And in fact, they had, they had kind of guaranteed their own decline. Um, Detroit is not an anomaly. Detroit's the canary in the coal mine. And I think the, the, the thing that we have to deal with, first of all, we're not all going to fail as Detroit has failed. We are all going to fail differently. <laughs> we're all, we're all, our experiment with this development pattern is all going to end differently. California's is going to end differently than Detroit's. Texas's is going to end way differently than California or Detroit. These are like extreme situations. You guys, I, 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 I don't know this place well enough. I've been here uh, uh, like three times, four times now. I'm starting to get a sense of it, but I, I don't have my pulse on it the way in other places. Um, but I think the message from Detroit is that we want, we want to avoid spending the last of our wealth propping up failure. We want to spend the last of our wealth seeding and transitioning to something viable. And I think if we can frame like our dialogue that way, I hate to start the Q&A with Detroit, but you, you brought us there. Um, <laughs> to me, uh, we should, our goal should be to avoid the, the collapse that is Detroit. Because we don't have to collapse that way. We do have to contract and we will have less, if we measure our success in the area we occupy and the, the, the number of car trips taken per day and the number of feet of pipe in our system, if that's how we measure success, we're going to fail because all those things are going to be reduced. But if we measure success in the wealth of our people, the amount of opportunity that is afforded, the amount of, uh, of, of opportunity that people have to bootstrap themselves and, be, and become better, the way that our system responds to individual needs. If we, if we measure success that way, I think we have a chance to be like vastly more successful. But the question is going to be, how do we spend that last bit of wealth we have? Do we spend it the way we did in 2008, which is, oh my gosh, we're in recession, our economists are telling us spend money, where's our shovel-ready projects? What's a shovel-ready project? A shovel-ready project is a project that got developed through the bureaucracy, got to the point where the politicians and the public looked at it and said, oh, that's horrible. We're not going to do that. Like, really? That much money for that? That's ridiculous. Put that on the shelf. And so then, all of a sudden, the money came in because we had to spend money because we had to keep people to work because that's what our economists told us to do. And so we went around and did like the dumbest of the dumb projects. That's, if we are going to repeat that over and over, then Detroit's inevitable. But if we can develop a different framework and say, no, here's what we're going to do differently. We're going to get at the neighborhood scale. We're going to make many small investments over a broad area over a long period of time. I, I challenge the group I met with today. I would start with the premise that we're not going to build another road anywhere and then see what kind of world that creates for us and then adapt to that because right now, Everything we do is premised on building more stuff. If we just said we're not going to build any more stuff, what kind of world does that bring about? So to me, I, I think that that's the challenge of Detroit for us here in the Northwest. How to, uh, how to physically contract while financially, culturally, socially expand. Please. I'm an engineer, so, so let's be clear, okay. there's a limited, uh, you know, there's a limited range of answers that are going to come. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, what you make, what you say makes so much sense, and, and thank you for putting it in a way that I can repeat to other people, and they can also understand. I've, I've intuitively understood this for years, but now I can say it in words that other people can understand. I appreciate that. But, you know, we, our, our culture, all our choices for so many decades have taught us to prefer 
this lifestyle. Not speaking to me personally, no, but you're right. but many people that I know and love and 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 would like to <laughs> have them embrace this other way, but but they they yeah. it, it's like a different planet to them. Yeah. And I'll tell you, and I, you're a member, I know, and you've been reading our blog for a long time, and you know that in the last year, one of the themes I've really struggled with is uh, the, the, how we avoid going crazy. You guys are taking us to dark places that I wasn't going, but um, I, I... It's a fog. Yeah, it's a fog. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I try to avoid politics, and I said I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm loathing the fact that we're in election year because it becomes like all-consuming and we become crazy people. But if you, if you look at the last year, and really you can start with August of 2014 in Missouri, um, you know, as, as the point where I started to like really write about this. I know there are lots of other people before, but I'm an engineer and that's not what I do. But... You can study societies in the past, and you know Germany after World War I is a, is a great example of this, of where here's one way that we looked at ourselves, and one way that we thought about ourselves, and then our world changed, and as we struggled to try to make sense of what that change was and what it actually meant for the way we looked at ourselves, we wound up going crazy. And the thing that I kind of reflexively fear about us as a country uh, is that we are human, we are very powerful, we have narratives that are part of our national collective about how we are great, which I, I, I mean, I buy into to a degree, I think we are great in many ways, uh, but as the world, as we've defined great, starts to change, how do we avoid going crazy? I don't think that's a left or right thing. I think the left and right in our country are both equally crazy, and they both say equally crazy things. I think what it is is it's a human thing. And I, I guess the, the, the way that I personally feel about, you know, how do we reach these people who seem to be on a completely different planet um, is to understand that they will never leave their planet and come to us. We have to leave our planet and go to them and understand the world through their eyes and then try to help them make sense, like clear the fog a little bit and make sense. They're never going to grasp it the way you do. They're never going to look at the way you do and say, this is, this is the best, this is great, I'm totally with you. Maybe some of them will, but most of them won't. But the goal should not be to get them, you know, to like, I want to live in an apartment in Portland, right? I live, you know... I live in my suburban home now and I want to be, become a vegan in Portland, right? That's like not, but what you want is for them to understand what's going on to the point where they won't go crazy. That's, that, that, that's movement, right? That's movement and that's, that's winning in a sense. Because the world is shifting whether we want it to or not. Um, you know, we, we went through this whole thing after World War II where we were the, la the last person, we were the last country standing. We were the richest, the wealthiest, we owned all the oil, we owned all the trade, we owned the money, we owned everything. We don't now. And that's all changing. And so our world is changing, and if we can't explain it to, to people, we, 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 we can't expect them to, you know, become enlightened internationalists. Over, you know, all we have to do is say, how do we get you to not go crazy? How do we get you to not intern, uh, you know, Japanese in World War II, right? Like, how do, we, how do we not do that? And that doesn't mean, how do we get you to, like, marry your son to a, a Japanese woman, right? But we're just like, how do you not, uh, how do you, you know, agree with me that that's not okay? And if we can get to that point, a lot of the other momentum is going to clear paths for us. I mean, people, one of the things that people always tell me or used to tell me in reaction to this presentation, they said, Chuck, you're a doomer. Uh, we're resilient and we'll overcome. And I would say, no, I'm not a doomer. Yes, we are resilient and yes, we will overcome. We always do. Humans will. But that doesn't mean we'll be able to continue doing what we're doing. It means we'll go through adversity and we'll change and we'll overcome it. I totally agree with that. So help them to do that.
But don't look at it as like frustration if they don't agree with you. Because they don't have to agree with you if you're right. Um, I, just, I just finished... Uh, I, I just finished um, this, these two books over break, uh, and they both had a, a, a lot of references to Charles Darwin. And it's fascinating because I did, I, you know, I, I know the science of Darwin, and I've, 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 I've studied and read it, I grasp, I get the, you know, the ecological implications, it's brilliant work. What I didn't understand, what both of these books focused on, was the, the reaction to Darwin, not the Scopes monkey trial reaction, not the reaction of the clergy or what have you, but the reaction to Darwin of other scientists, his peers, scientific peers. And do you know that the reaction to Darwin amongst his peers was brutal, just cruel? You are, you know, crazy. These are terrible ideas. They're unfounded. You're going against thousands of years of collective knowledge. You don't know what you're talking about. And... Darwin wrote at the end of Origin of Species, if you actually go online and just Google it and go to the very end, there's a last section, you can go about uh, five paragraphs from the end, and he wrote this beautiful paragraph where he says, I'll paraphrase him, he said, there's a whole bunch of people who are going to react negatively to this, and some of them just need to retire, (laughs) and some of them just need to die and go away. I am very confident that as new people with fresh eyes without the dogma of our current system come forth that these ideas will get a fair hearing and ultimately, if I'm right, they'll be adopted by the mainstream. And of course, within a a, a couple decades, that's what happened. So to me, I feel like if you are a strong town supporter, what we need to do is not win every argument. We just need to seed our ideas in enough places where as the old paradigm falls away, there's a, a new set of ideas that we can grasp onto that hopefully in a generation will be like, of course, that's the way you do it. That's like logical. And look at those neophytes who thought something different back in 2015. <laughs> um, anybody else? Please. I have to say that I am curious about the examples that you showed That's one of the greatest questions I've ever gotten. Thank you. Thank you. Um, My boss is right there. Oh, really? <laughs> that is a brilliant question, and you are a brilliant person. Um, that, no, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, let, me, let me reword it the way I would get it a few years ago uh, in, a, in a more ignorant way. I'm going to reword it. Um, Chuck, why do you want us to go back and live in the 20s? I don't want a horse and buggy. I don't want manure in the streets. I don't want an outhouse and a burn barrel. This is going backwards, right? And you're saying physically, but also economically and socially, there were a lot of things wrong with that construct. Am I idealizing that? And what are the implications of that that construct, right? Is that a fair way? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to disagree with that. Um, there's a whole, like, train of sustainability thought that I've, I've never been able to reach and get to. Okay, I, I, I'm not there. Uh, that, that, you know, human population growth, the Industrial Revolution, like, all these things, like, were the, the, the beginning of the problem. And, like, I can theoretically grasp that, but it's, it's too far of a reach for me to actually go because I, I have no clue how to deal with that. You know, if Malthus is correct, we're going to have, you know, at some point a population collapse and what have you, and I, I don't know how to deal with that. But I think some of the implications of, okay, Chuck, if you look back at that period in America, this wasn't the greatest 
time to be around. I mean, you did have sewage in the streets and, you know, people were being exploited and you showed the nice two blocks in the center of town where all the rich people lived and all the poor people lived on, on the edge in the slums and you didn't show that. That wasn't great. Is that Those are all like really important, important insights. And let me, let me back up even further because you can go back and look at ancient Rome uh, and there's vestiges of this there still today, but you, you can see that we have had this pattern of development for a long, long time. It goes like this. I'm going to put this mic down. Here's the way that cities were built for thousands of years in, bre in a brief form. Rich people, poor people, countryside. Rich people, poor people, the countryside. Here's what we did in America. We took this and said, nope, rich people are going to be here. Poor people are going to be here. And then we're going to, you know, have countryside or, you know, to build and develop to some way. So what we did is we inverted the natural order of things. Was this natural order of things good and just and fair? No, no. And if you go back to the 1920s, there was the City Beautiful movement. There were other... Uh, I mean, that's when you had the suffrage movement, that's when you had prohibition. You had all these things that were trying to deal with, like, the social condition of, of society. Prohibition, if you ever get a chance, watch Ken Burns' two-part series on prohibition. Absolutely fascinating, because we think today, in 2015, prohibition was about liquor. It was not. Prohibition was about women getting beaten. People, men would come home, uh, beat their wives, and then you would say, well, he was caught with the spirits. He was wrapped up in the, you know, the drink or whatever. And they would, like, they, would, they would excuse it by saying he was taken by alcohol. And so there was this movement, prohibition, to essentially say, we're going to get rid of that excuse. Like, you can't come home now drunk and beat your wife. And it was not the drunk, it was the beating your wife. And actually, prohibition went away because we were able to kind of break through that barrier. It came along the same times as suffrage and many other things. When we look at the traditional development pattern, the, the challenges we face is that the last model we have of it working as a resilient economic model is also this exploitive one. And this is where I think our great challenge arises because can we have a development pattern that is strong and resilient? And, and, and by that, I'm going to go back to rich people surrounded by poor people. Let me reframe it into what I think would be a strong and resilient pattern. A uh, productive place, financially productive place, surrounded by places transitioning to productive. Okay? Can we have that without exploitation? I think so but I don't know if it's a universal yes, and I don't know if A automatically leads to B. So I think we're always going to have those kind of latent challenges. But let me, let me just give you one example of how I think a, a system that is more, say, emergent and natural in terms of our development pattern, as opposed to this experiment, actually creates opportunity for people. If you look at the standard form of development, and I, I visited Pompeii. Have any of you ever been to Pompeii? When you walk in and you walk through the gates of first, and you're walking down the very first street, along that very first street are a bunch of places that were shops. And it was fascinating because the front was a shop and the back was a house. And they were connected and there was a door in between. And you realize that even back in this day, the people who were bootstrapping themselves had a little shop in front of their house. And you can imagine that, like, the husband in those days would have gone to work somewhere and the wife and the kids would have stayed home and minded the shop. And you could watch the shop at the same time that you watch the family. And you could have some supplemental income. And so all of a sudden, if you were willing to do it, you could essentially turn your abode into a modest income stream that could supplement your life. You could build that up. If you were successful, you could eventually occupy the whole house with the store and build a second story. You could rent that out and move out to, you know, the richer part of the community. There was a way for you to incrementally grow as the community grew. We've wiped that out now today. You can't start a little place. 
you can't bootstrap out of your home. It's illegal. You can't bootstrap a main street because you got to have parking and signs and code enforcement and all this, you know, stuff. You can't do it. So to me, I feel like this transition is going to afford us the opportunity to have more of those kind of like micro opportunities that aren't available today. You and I talked a little bit about marijuana dispensing. The one thing that I find absolutely fascinating about states that have adopted a more uh, uh, open view of marijuana is that it is, there is no Walmart of marijuana, right? It is a very bottom up, grassroots, <laughs> so hilarious, <laughs> kind of operation, right? And so you're seeing like the mechanics of the way businesses used to operate and grow start to, start to, to as, a, as a model, take place in, in this one industry. Um, I think our challenge today is to look back and learn from the best, from a layout design and function of the traditional development pattern we can while keeping our modern values and sensibilities. And, and I, I really don't want anyone to leave this room thinking that Chuck Marone says the ideal that we should go back to is 1920. Because I don't. I, I really don't. I think we have made tons of progress and I don't want to go back. But what I think we need to do is say there's lots of stuff we can learn. Nobody has been here before. Our job is not to go out and build new cities. It's to actually reconstruct ours to be successful. Where's the knowledge to do that? It doesn't exist. We have to create it. How do we create it? To me, we create it by looking back to what worked and seeing what of that we can apply to today, applying it incrementally and seeing how that goes, and then adapting. So uh, to me, that's the takeaway. Not that like we should bring back kids working in sweatshops, which is the exploitive model of the 1920s. Right? You can go read Dickens and see that like the 1920s, you know, Dickens was earlier than that, right? Yeah, but like the, the, he was the first Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, took people who lived very hard lives in the countryside and had them live very hard but very different lives in the city. And, you know, was that human progress? In many ways it was, but in many ways it wasn't. Did I kind of answer your question? Thank you. Please. So I wonder, how did your city in Brainerd um, respond to your report where you suggest, suggesting eight small changes? If I imagine if they liked it, you're making those changes, and if they didn't, um, because our cities our city staff have become the gatekeepers of change. We can't just do, we can't just improve our own neighborhoods without getting in trouble for it. So I'm curious about where you are on that continuum. Yeah. Um, well, let's just say I'm not nominated for Citizen of the Year. Um, <laughs> my family's been in this town for over 100 years now. Uh, over a hundred years, and um, you, you know, there's a there's there's a saying ascribed to Jesus, right? You're never a prophet in your own land. You're never a prophet in your own land. Chuck was the drummer in the high school band. Who is this guy telling us what to do? What makes him know anything? It's a very frustrating thing, and 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 it's healthy for me to get away from the city and come do things like this. Uh, because I can see them more clearly than when I'm there. It's kind of like your family. You get frustrated because you know like all the dumb things they do. And when you get away from them, you can look at them and say, well, they're not bad people. They're just caught up in, the, you know, this. Um, I was, when we started this thing, uh, I was drugged down to the city council. Um, they actually kind of tricked me because they said, we'd like you to come meet with us, the staff. And I had been to meet with the staff a couple times. And I'm like, okay, I'll come meet with you again on this. And when I got there, they had the whole council arrayed, called the meeting to order, and then spent the next hour and a half chewing me out. Um, who are you? Why are you doing this? You're not running this past the city. We need to approve all this. 
And um, it did not go well. Uh, when I finished the report uh, and we, we gave it to them, it was not well received. Um, if you actually go through it, just type neighborhoods first strong towns on Google and you get a copy of the report. Uh, in no place does it say, like, these people are a bunch of idiots. Uh, but it does go through and point out, like, look, here's a picture of our park. And then here's a picture of the road median. The park is overgrown with weeds and has, like, is just nasty. And the median of the road has, like, beautiful flowers and trees. What's going on here? And so it's a bunch of, like, things like that. And you know, we did a speed study. Like, here's the cop parked at the school. You spend money, you don't have enough money for the police, you're cutting police, yet you send an officer over here every day because the cars speed by the school. Look, we did the speed study and we showed that when we narrow the lanes, speeds reduce by 30%. Why don't we just narrow the lanes once, $5,000, then you can avoid sending the cop every day, everything will be better. That was deeply embarrassing to people, right? So it, it is really hard within a city where you are embedded and like a, a member of the community to, to have these conversations. It has not been well received. I will say it's getting better. I have three council members now that I talk to regularly who say I would love to do this, but I don't have the support that I need to. Um, there are members of the community that we meet regularly and talk about this, and I think two of them will run for council against two of the worst people on the council. So now I'm finding myself as an activist at the local level. I never meant to be. Um, but no, it's not been embraced and it's not easy. And, you know, I, I, we have a highway through the middle of the city that's just horrible that the DOT is coming in and redoing. And we put a group together to try to get that narrowed. Uh, and if you go to a better sixth, 6th6th.org, I put together a website all about the project. And, you know, they put me on the front page of the paper. They put my ideas in the paper. I was able to write like four columns explaining it. The newspaper wrote an endorsement of my plan. The city voted 7-0 to, to, to not do it and to do something else. And the like letters of the editor were, you know, this guy is some like big city elitist who thinks he can tell us what to do, you know? Even though like I'm from there, like I live there, I've lived there all my life. <laughs> so. No, it, it's not. It, it, it is a continual source of frustration. And I, I do think um, I have had this thought in my head for a, a, a long time. Um, and I think everybody has to decide this to a degree. And, and as things continue to change, I think it's going to become more prescient for more people. And this is really the, the, the migration question that people have had for millennia. This is what's driving people out of Syria today. Am I better off staying here and doing what I can to make it work, or am I better off leaving and starting someplace new? And I think if you don't struggle with that, either you're not alive, or not involved, or, or, or you're in a great place, right? And hopefully it's the latter. But if you do struggle with that, I think it's a very real question. Um, and I've spent a lot of time looking is there a better place for me? And I, I've, I have not found it yet. Uh, but I will say today, in, in, uh, someone sent me a, you know how they'll do like those BuzzFeed lists for like the top 10 cities for this and that? They had one for the, the highest educated or the best education cities in the country. And my town was number two in the state of Minnesota. And I've got two kids in school. And I went through this school. I think it was pretty good. And so th there's, a, there's, like, there's things like that that make me like, okay, I like this place. I'm staying. Maybe not forever. And uh, on your uh, website or your blog list, is there a bibliography that you would recommend? Uh, oh, like recommended reading? Yeah. Um, do I have a recommended reading list? Um, you and I talked beforehand. So I know you like Nassim Taleb, which I've read. If, if, when people ask me that at a thing, I say, go read anything by Nassim Taleb, The Black Swan or Anti-Fragile. Those are kind of like foundational things for my thinking. Um, read anything by Jared Diamond, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Collapse, uh, The World Before Yesterday, The World Before Tomorrow, World Before Yesterday. Just read it. 
Jared Diamond, brilliant. Um, I think you can read anything by Jane Jacobs, obviously, brilliant. Um, Suburban Nation, it, it was one of those books where I was searching for answers and just laid it out so clearly. Um, but beyond that, we, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a readaholic. And so, like last year, I think I read 56 books, something like that. Um, I, I, I have a Pinterest account, and because so many people ask, I just post every book I read to Pinterest. So everything from 2014 and 2015 that I've read is up there. I'm starting 2016, obviously. If there's something on there and you're like, well, should I read this? Is it good? Just email me and I'll, I'll tell you if I liked it or not. But I put every book up there and usually I, I don't put the ones that are horrible. So there's, a, there's at least, you know, a hundred and some books up there that I thought were worthy. I don't read any planning books. And not that I don't find planning books interesting, but I think that like we have, how many of you are, this is an APA function. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, yeah, I don't read any books that APA puts out. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I know they do. Thank you. Um, I think, and like I, I, I am, am fortunate enough to be asked to lecture in front of students all the time. And I tell students, um, I, I, I think that the last generation was about specializing and becoming like really good at something because that's what made sense in our economy. But I'm more and more convinced that the next generation uh, will not be about specialty, but will be about cross-disciplinary understanding. The person who can understand ecology and computer science is gonna have like way more opportunity to make positive change than the person who's really great at ecology or really great at computer science. Because it's about connections. The web, the internet, the world we live in is a cross-connected world and people who have cross-connected knowledges are the new, you know, the new renaissance people of, of this time. So I, I find, I, I don't, you should read planning stuff, read everything APA publishes. Um, <laughs> but after that, try to read stuff like in a bunch of different areas. Starting with Nassim Taleb. Um, are we out of time or are we good? Um, you could maybe, if there's one more question, maybe okay. Rick Roth wants to gather folks together to talk about Gotcha. Something. Please. I just want to point out a, a local example here. We're in a district, uh, the Woodland District here in Lacey, that has been studied and looked at as a place where more activity might happen. The transit center is nearby. There's variety of different kinds of uses right here in this area, in this district. Frankly, I find it quite unwalkable, and when I looked at it on satellite, I thought, oh my God, look at how much is taken up by parking, and how do you get from one parking lot to another if you're walking? But small things in this district will make a big difference. Small things. It won't be an explosion of one big thing that happens here in this district, this renovation or change of use of this building is a small thing maybe. But now, what do you do about the fact that there's so much going on here? I think it's gonna be small things that change the walkability, the enjoyability of this area. There's a park here. I mean, this has got a lot of potential, <coughs> but it's not gonna be some giant grant from the state of the feds that's gonna make it fantastically transform in 24 hours. It's gonna be incremental small things I, I could not agree more. And let me, let me give one example that was crazy to me until I saw it. Um, there's a guy named Monty Anderson uh, who's, who's part of the Small Scale Developers Alliance. He has done, when people thought it was insane in the 70s, 80s, 90s, everyone was building huge things. He was out building these micro things in, in the Dallas area. And he, I mean, he's become very rich and never done a big project. He's done all these little tiny things. And he was telling me about stuff he did. And he said, Chuck, you start with a tent. <laughs> I'm like, a tent? What do you, you, you've got to be joking me. Like, how do you start with a tent? He's like, no, you start with a tent. And he showed me, and we actually went out. And by tent, he means like, he has like street vendors. But he'll take the parking lot and take two of the spots and say, all right, we need the parking for this building but hopefully someday we'll have development here. 
and we won't need all this parking. So we're not gonna make that transformation overnight by making some massive investment that's gonna you know, get rid of all this parking and, and then totally fail because the place isn't set up. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna take one or two of these parking spots and we're gonna put a little tent here and we're gonna have a little like street vendor right here, right now and see how that works. And then we're gonna get that going and get like the ecosystem going around that and then we can make that a permanent thing with a little building. And then after a while we can add on another building and another building and he showed me how these things get built out over time and it is brilliant it is really 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 brilliant but it's all incremental and it starts at a place that we're culturally uncomfortable with starting because it seems beneath us it seems beneath us to start with a tent but out here is not a great place like i'm not saying this is horrible but it's not very walkable, it's not very scaled, it, it, it is not um, very adaptable. You know, I, I don't get what the next generation is of this place out here without massive interventions. There's no logical like next step. And when there's no logical next step, that means you have a finite thing that will fail someday. So there's a lot of things that can be done right here to help make this place more financially productive, more successful, more emergent, and I think starting exactly the way you describe is the way to go. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure, um, I'm sure. It's a, uh, um, I have learned, what's the, you can't judge a book by its cover, right? Um, we, sometimes the, ba uh, Lafayette, what were the most successful neighborhoods? They were the, po where the poor people lived. They were the worst neighborhoods. They were the neighborhoods that, if I had snapped a photo of the neighborhood here and a photo of the neighborhood here, you would have said, that neighborhood looks great. They're doing great things and oh, that neighborhood looks terrible. Yet that terrible neighborhood was killing it and that great neighborhood was sucking the place dry. Don't trust your brain. Your eyes will confuse you. They will make you see things that are not there because that's how we're wired to do. We've, I don't want to get like apocalyptic and I don't want to get like, you know, but we have created a system of, of, of development and a development pattern and an approach that provides us with this very comfortable illusion of wealth. Makes you look successful, makes you feel successful. And at the end of the day, it is, it is a system that is slowly robbing, it's exploiting us in the sense that it robs us of our wealth and robs us of our potential, while the whole time making us feel the opposite. And it, it's so seductive, and I, I think that that's the, that's the, the, the thing that is so hard because we're wired to look at Wendy's, Target, you know, th this whole, you know, the Wells Fargo building, I'm trying to think of what else was right out here. That's, you know, all these things we're, we're like programmed to look at because it's clean, it's nice, it's got, you know, good lines. It, it's all like, it looks like success. But when you, you go under the hood, you do the math, you look at the numbers, you start talking to the people you look at how they live their lives and interact with it. You look at the money that has to be spent to survive in this environment, and you realize that it's not, we're conditioned to see success different than the way we would objectively measure it. And I, I just would really caution you to um, not trust your eyes, but try to dig deeper. All right. Thank you.